very good afternoon to all i abhilash bl assistant professor department of civil engineering i will be the mc for the today's event i warm welcome to you all for the online gate training program 2022 today we have two session between 2 to 3:30 and 3:45 to 5:15 and today's speaker is professor madhushree c I welcome Madhushri C, Assistant Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, BBC Mysore. Welcome you, ma'am. Professor Madhushri C completed BE in Civil Engineering from Pes College of Engineering, Mandya, and obtained Master's degree in Hydraulics from National Institute of Engineering, Mysore. And currently, she is pursuing PhD from NITK Suratkal. She has published. more than 5 national and international journals and delivered n number of lectures and presented conference papers in international journals now i would like to hand over the session to the professor madhushree thank you sir i hope the uh, screen is visible very good afternoon uh, to everyone once again uh, welcome all uh, to uh, the day 7 uh, sessions so for hydrology and irrigation engineering i'll be taking two sections and one session for irrigation engineering so accordingly we have divided uh, certain topics related to hydrology for two sessions and irrigation engineering for one session so let us uh, begin with the hydrology components so as per uh, you know the syllabus for the gate with respect to hydrology this is how the syllabus goes some of the important topics like uh, precipitation and its measurements we need to study about hydrographs groundwater hydrology and flood routing coming to the uh, syllabus of irrigation engineering these are the topics which comes under irrigation engineering the topics are the water requirements of crops gravity dams and spillways water logging and then we have weirs or pitfalls so without further delay we'll just understand how the marks distribution is with respect to hydrology so we uh, you know really depending on that we can rely on how uh, important topics how much the, uh, important topics that we have to understand and study on what topics we'll have to pay more attention to how do we prioritize our topics so depending on that it will be very easy for you to analyze so you can see in set 1 there were uh, you know for three uh, marks that is one mark questions and in set 2 for two marks there were two questions so this is how uh, the you know for the recent past 5 uh, years this is how the marks distribution was for you know particularly the hydrology uh, component similarly for irrigation engineering this is how the marks distribution is if you see for the last 5 years uh, so by analysis of the marks you can easily understand that most of the questions were asked from hydrology and very few questions Uh, either one or two questions from set one or set two was asked based on irrigation engineering. So uh, we'll understand basis on the analysis of the marks distribution for both hydrology and irrigation engineering. We'll just prioritize our topics, which are given as high weightage, and then which are given as low weightage topics. So these are some of the high weightage topics like precipitation concept. mean precipitation calculations of that point rainfall analysis infiltration hydrographs and well hydrologics if you come to you know uh, relatively low weightage topics like transportation and evaporation and then you have maximum flood estimation and uh, you know flood routing river gauging etc and also you have uh, the topics on gravity dams and spillways design of canals diversion headworks 
So this is how I've, uh, you know, uh, briefly given or uh, prioritized between the high weightage and the low weightage topics. So we'll directly go into uh, the topics of hydrology to understand the precipitation. First, we need to know the concept of hydrological cycle. So I think most of you would be knowing by definition how the hydrological cycle would work. It is nothing but a continuous process. So how these processes occur, the water evaporates, forms the cloud, and then it forms falls back onto the earth in the form of various forms of precipitation. And again, the form or this cycle is continuous. So it is a continuous cycle. You can see a graphical representation here. So here, uh, the most important terminologies that we have to understand is about uh, the precipitation, evaporation, evapotranspiration, surface detention or transpiration, which is occurring, you know, infiltration. So these are some of the terminologies that you need to understand. So commonly, you know, when the waters it just evaporate from the clouds, so it condenses back to fall onto the earth in the form of precipitation. So once the precipitation falls back onto the surface, not all the water would reach to the surface, uh, you know. So there are various interflows, like you have the flow towards your surface detention, a part of the water which gets infiltrated and leads to groundwater flow, which in turn increases the groundwater table and again, the water which is stored in the surface detention, when it is reached to the maximum level, that is depression storage. And then again, it overflows to, you know, uh, go reach to the nearby any other stream channels. And again, the process is continuous. It evaporates and then condenses back in the form of precipitation. So before uh, it lands on the surfaces, also the interception occurs. So through which not only with evaporation, we have also the losses related to transpiration. So these are some of the terminologies that uh, you need to understand. So if you, you know, to just know the terminologies, if you could analyze related to that. So one thing, as I said, the precipitation is the most important terminology. So it is in general of all forms of moisture originating from the clouds, which falls back onto the ground. So the portion of that part of hydrologic cycle where the atmospheric water vapor is condensed, forming water droplets with such you know, sufficiently large that gravity because of that causes them to fall back to the earth. So one is precipitation. Then second most important terminology is infiltration. So obviously, as I said, not all the water which reaches to the, you know, or leads to the surface runoff, but also infiltration process occurs. So it is the process by which the water enters into the ground surface to soil. So uh, the infiltration capacity majorly depend on the rate of infiltration of that particular soil. So the next terminology that we have to understand is surface detention or depression storage, where the part of the water or the precipitation which gets stored into before reaching it to a nearby channel. So that is called as surface detention or depression storage. So once uh, the water infiltrate and increases its, um, you know, increases the uh, water table, obviously the, the water level below the surface raises up. So this we have to know. So the upper surface of this zone of saturation is known as water table. So these are some of the terminologies which is most important to be known in terms of hydrological cycle. So we understood that the main terminology, because, you know, for groundwater level to increase or for the water table rise or, you know, for many losses, precipitation is the major form for all those things. So we need to understand the concept of precipitation in a much more, you know, understandable way. So any form of moisture reaching the Earth's surface from the atmosphere is known as precipitation, any form of moisture. 
but what should be the minimum conditions for the precipitations to form the atmosphere must have moisture sufficient nuclei should be present to aid that condensation process which leads to the formation of precipitation and also you know a feasible weather condition should be there because the condensation has to occur the condensation of the water vapors you know the product of that condensation must reach the earth so then it is called as precipitation so we have various uh, forms of uh, precipitation again here also there are you know they usually get confused between the types of precipitation and forms of precipitation so we have different forms of uh, you know precipitation like a rainfall or rain hail uh, we have and also we have sleet we also we have freezing rain so when it comes to rainfall how do you differentiate between the rain or hail or dew drops so there should be some differentiation so how do we differentiate between uh, the different forms of precipitation is through the size of the drops so if the drops are much larger than the drizzle that is 0.02 inch or 0.5 mm or more then you consider it to be rain so if the size of that water droplets are much more less compared to this given range, then you call it as rain drops. Okay. So then what is the difference in drizzle? So it is nothing but uh, the same water droplets, but it is very fine drops. Okay. Usually we get, you know, normally it is very difficult to bifurcate because often fog and drizzle occurs together so it becomes very difficult to bifurcate that. the next is sleet so the precipitation of transparent or translucent pellets of ice which are round or irregular hard grains of ice consisting of frozen raindrops large or it can also be stated as largely melted uh, you know refrozen snowflakes then it is known as sleet the next is hail so this we already know. So individual hailstones, the size varies from quarter inch, that is 5 mm or greater in diameter. So usually the sizes, uh, hail sizes of 1 inch, uh, 2.5 centimeter or more are indicative of severe thunderstorms. So this is how we bifurcate. We have snow pellets. Again, if the diameters are less than quarter inch, that is 5 mm, less than 5 mm, then we call it as snow pellets. Again, uh, you know, uh, snow, it is also the precipitation, one of the form of the precipitation in terms of snow crystals. Okay. So this is the major thing that we need to understand. So we saw that uh, rain droplets, it is the size is greater than 0.5 mm. To summarize what we saw related to forms of precipitation, then we have drizzle, which are fine uh, sprinkle of water droplets of size, which are less than 0.5 mm. And when it comes to, this is dependent on the size, when it comes to intensity, which is less than one millimeter per hour. So when it comes to rainfall, how do we usually, uh, you know, call it as heavy rainfall, light rainfall, or moderate rainfall based on its intensity? We call it as uh, light rain when the intensity is you know very less or from traces to 2.5 millimeter per hour then we call it as very light rain uh, we call it as very moderate rainfall when the uh, intensity is between the range 2.5 to 7.5 millimeter per hour and then we call it as heavy rainfall when the intensity is greater than or equal to 7.5 millimeter per hour so the next is sleet, which is also called as ice pellets. We saw the uh, you know graphical representation there, where the size varies from one millimeter to four millimeters. The next is hail. It is also a form of balls or irregular lumps of ice over five mm in diameter, greater than five millimeters of diameter. So this is a summary of forms of precipitation. So the next is types of precipitation. So we have the first type is thermal or conventional or convective precipitation. We have frontal precipitation. We have orographic precipitation and cyclonic precipitation. So thermal uh, you know, or conventional convective precipitation, which majorly occurs due to the upward movement of air that is warmer than the surroundings. 
usually occurs uh, in the regions of high temperature or tropics on a hot day that is a very uh, high temperature where the warmer air lifts up unequally causing that warmer air to lift up as the colder air comes to take space its place so warmer air what happens because of that when it replaces the warmer air cools adiabatically to form a cauliflower shaped cloud we can easily imagine the shape of the cloud right which finally bursts into thunder so that is convective precipitation the next we have frontal precipitation so when does this frontal precipitation occurs majorly when uh, two air masses due to the contrasting temperature intensities clash with each other then the condensation which occurs to form uh, you know to leading to the formation of precipitation is known as frontal precipitation so this that surface of contact when the two air masses you know come and collide that contact surface contact is called front or frontal surface so here we have two parts one is cold front or warm front so cold front is nothing but if cold air masses drives out the warm air mass where cold air mass is much more protective than we call it as cold front if the warm air mass replaces the retreating cold air mass then we call it as warm front also we have stationary front which is nothing but these are the terminologies that you need to know it might be asked for the one mark question so stationary front if the two air masses are drawn simultaneously towards a lower pressure then we call it as stationary front Okay, so there is also one more terminology that we need to understand is occlusion. So it is a phenomenon in which the front surface of cold and warm air slide against each other. Then we call it as occlusion. Okay, and then the resulting frontal surface is called occluded front. So this is the difference. Okay, frontal surface or occluded front, which occurred mainly due to occlusion forces. The next is orographic precipitation. Orographic precipitation majorly occurs due to the mechanical lifting of moist air over the mountain barriers, which causes heavy precipitation on the windward side. We call it as orographic precipitation. So this kind of precipitation majorly occurs in uh, mountainous regions. Example, Chirapunji in Himalayan region or Agumbe in Western Ghats or South India. So some of the examples. Orographic precipitation. The next is, you know, uh, cyclonic precipitation. So cyclone or cyclonic precipitation majorly, uh, you know, occurs due to the lifting of moist air converging into a low pressure belt. So it can be, you know, spirally inward and clockwise in southern hemisphere. So that is how the cyclonic precipitation occurs. So in that, we have, you know, two kinds. One is tropical cyclone or extra tropical cyclone. Okay, so what is the difference between tropical cyclone and extra tropical cyclone is that for a tropical cyclone, the diameter is small, varying between 300 to 1,500 kilometers, which causes high wind velocity and heavy precipitation. When it comes to extra tropical cyclone, the diameter can go up to 3,000 kilometers and causes widespread front type precipitation. So this is the difference between tropical cyclone and extra tropical cyclone, which comes under cyclonic precipitation. So we understood how important the precipitation is and, uh, you know, how the forms of precipitation and the types of precipitation occurs. The next important thing that we need to know is about the world water distribution. Okay. So this was particularly taken from, uh, you know, the report, the World Water Development Report, which was given from 2020. Uh, I've also put uh, the website link. You can also visit there. You can easily see that uh, the availability of, you know, the fresh water, how the distribution of Earth's water is, and what is the amount of fresh water which is available. With that amount of fresh water, how the water is again distributed. Okay, so total of 100% availability, we have only 2% of fresh water. And again, in that, how the water is again distributed. So you can see majorly it is included in the glaciers and ice caps, but and also groundwater availability. Whereas the surface water in terms of rivers and lakes, we have only 1%. 
So we need to understand what is ability. We saw what is the world, what a distribution. So also we need to understand what is the availability is. So for us, the major basic source of precipitation is rainfall. So it might not be same for even the northern region, but for the northern region, the basic source of precipitation might be snowfall. So accordingly, we have to deal with the type of precipitation we have. So our basic source being rainfall, we have uh, around 3000 rain gauge stations set up from IMD, that is India Meteorological Department with average annual rainfall as 119.4 centimeter of about annual uh, water resources as 4,000 kilometer cube, okay? Out of which uh, 700 kilometer cube of water or rainfall lost to atmosphere, 2,150 kilometer cube soaked into the ground and 1,150 kilometer cube results in direct runoff to the streams. So these are the values that you need to know. So what are the usual practical applications of hydrology? Why do we need to know? Why do we need to understand about you know, the precipitation process or the forms or the types of precipitation or it might be you know, water distribution or availability? What are its applications? You know? Uh, uh, the study of hydrology mainly deals with the design of hydraulic structures such as spillway, dam, culvert, highway bridge, rail bridge, etc. It also helps in uh, the water supplies, both municipal and industrial, for both industries and public. And also, it is one of the major source for irrigation, you know, to increase our economy through agriculture. It is also used for or have wide applications in hydropower to generate the electricity. Also flood control uh, in terms of reservoirs, channel, channel diversions or flood control structures, any kind of flood control uh, you know, structures. It is also have wide applications in navigation, erosion, sediment control, pollution abatement and various other applications. So we'll directly move on uh, to the topics which is important to, to understand, to know about or to study, uh, to easily uh, solve related to gate questions. So, so here I'll explain it in terms of concept wise and also I'll give certain clues and hints where we can easily uh, solve the given question with uh, some of the hints. Okay. So uh, the precipitation entire concept is divided into these four important sectors. So first sector is about optimum number of rain gauge, where you need to calculate the optimum number of rain gauges. The next component is about the missing value. So you need to, uh, for the given uh, station's data, you need to calculate the missing station data with either uh, you know applying any of the method which is mentioned here simple average or normal ratio using any of these two methods you need to calculate the missing rainfall data and also we need to study about mass curve and hydrograph and then mean precipitation calculations this is also important okay so we'll try to take uh, one by one first to get to calculate uh, uh, the optimum number of rain gauges, first we need to understand about rain gauges. So why do we need these systems? So, you know, any of the form of precipitation which falls in the terms of, you know, in the form of rainfall, which reaches to the earth from the atmosphere, it has to be measured. We need to need, know what is the amount of rainfall occurring. So we saw what is the annual rainfall. We saw what is the annual groundwater. How can we quantify it with some of the instruments? Okay. So the rain gauge is also variously known with any, uh, you know, various terms like you have hydrometer, ohmometer, or fluviometer. Okay. These are all the rain gauge. What is this? Rain gauge is an instrument which can measure the amount of rainfall which occurs uh, during the particular duration. So here for the rain gauges, 
how do we select the site for the situation or the implementation of this range? So the site should be in the level ground and other types of ground like hilltops, hill slope, etc. Or if uh, that particular ground have any type of undulation or slope is not suitable. So majorly the ground should be level and it should be an open space and also uh, you know, the rain gauge should be kept at a particular distance from the nearest object is about, you know, twice the height of that object. So other uh, metrological instruments and the fencing of the site should maintain, you know, step three. That is when the rain gauge is, is situated, any other instruments, supporting instruments like fencing to protect that, you know, it should be, uh, the distance should be maintained. And then the distance is twice the height of that object. The site should be easily accessible, obviously. The gauge should be truly vertical. 10% of the total number of rain gauge stations of any basin should be self-recording. That is most important to avoid the manual work. The self-recording systems play a very important role. So the observer must visit the site regularly to ensure its proper leading uh, readiness for measurements because you know any instrument the maintenance becomes a very important role so once it is situated you cannot just ignore or neglect it so once in a while at least even though if it is a self-recording rain gauge once in a while you have to visit it and just see how well the measurements are happening so we have uh, various types of uh, you know rain gauges so these rain gauges are mainly classified into two types. One is non-recording or ordinary uh, rain gauges. Also, the second type is recording or automatic rain gauges. So uh, any common person can easily understand by the name what is a non-recording type or recording type uh, rain gauge system. Okay. So we'll take one by one, non-recording uh, type uh, rain gauge. You can see the uh, image here. You see non-recording type in the sense it is not self-recording. One has to go and then manually record it. The most common type of non-recording uh, rain gauge is Simon's gauge. Okay. So what does it do? It doesn't record it, but it only collects. So once the water or the rainfall is collected, we need to uh, take this measuring jar, pour the rainfall collected in the chamber to that measuring jar and measure it. Okay, so assume uh, this measuring jar is about uh, 25 millimeters. If the, uh, you know, the rainfall water collected in this collecting uh, cabinet is more than what we do, first we pour about 25 millimeter in the measuring jar, transfer it to another, uh, you know, uh, cylinder, Again, pour back the remaining uh, amount of water in the collecting chamber, measure it again, add the first measurement, the second measurement, you'll get what is the total amount. That is how usually it is done. So the receiver or the connecting bottle has a capacity of 175 millimeter of rain. So in case of uh, heavy rainfall region, where the rain gauge with receivers of uh, 375 mm to 1000 mm capacity will be uh, inserted to measure the rainfall depth. So in case of light or moderate rainfall, the receiver has 175 millimeters of rain capacity, whereas the regions where the heavy rainfall occurs, the rain gauge receivers have about 375 millimeters uh, or 1000 millimeter capacity. The next important thing is, uh, you know, uh, the recording type rain gauge. This is important. So, you know, it uh, usually uh, records, as the name itself says, the, it usually records and also plot the rainfall against time. So from the plot, we can easily extract the information about the density and the duration of that uh, rainfall event, which were uh, occurring, which are majorly important for many of the hydrological analysis. So here in recording type uh, rain gauge, we have three types. One is tipping bucket type siphon uh, flow type and weighing bucket type. We have these three types of recording rain gauge. Okay, so usually uh, this um, uh, system has a clock driven drum which carries a graph along with a pen 
so as and when uh, the rainfall gets stored in that it starts to rotate and then the the graph is plotted okay this is how the tipping bucket types work so you can see we have the receiver here is a tipping bucket once the amount of water gets stored to a certain level it tips once it bends and then it starts to uh, no, record so this is weighing bucket again we have you can see weighing type rain gauge we have you know a chart mounted to that it is similar to your um, uh, you know graph sheet kind so once the water gets stored when it becomes you know uh, heavier and heavier because of the weight what happens this chamber get pressed because of the spring as the uh, as the uh, the receiver get pressed once this pushes down again uh, here it starts to record because of the push so here in the weighing type of rain gauge it uh, mainly dependent on the spring balance so this is the most common uh, uh, you know recording type rain gauge is flow type or siphon rain gauge we have non recording type uh, rain gauge which is simon's rain gauge so here we have flow type uh, rain gauge or siphon rain gauge okay the same concept as tipping bucket and weighing bucket it has a clock driven drum as the water it falls uh, falls down it uh, you know the pen starts to record it and plot it on the graph okay so the next important thing we need to understand is about a water budget equation so water budget equation or hydrological equation Uh, it is simply that what is whatever the input you have minus the output which gives you the change in storage. So that is the common understanding of water budget equation. So mass inflow minus mass outflow will give you change in storage. So here you can see various you know the positive and the negative terms. Negative terms indicates the outflows. The positive term indicates your inflow. so precipitation we have inflow we have runoff we have groundwater flow we have evaporation we have transpiration these are all your losses so whatever the amount of precipitation is occurring it is divided into various components like groundwater it might be surface runoff evaporation transpiration so all these components which leads to losses becomes the negative terminology and then we have inflow as precipitation which is positive so inflow minus outflow we get uh, the change in storage so this is how uh, you know to easily understand if you have a water body we have precipitation we have groundwater outflow we have transpiration as losses evaporation as losses runoff as losses okay so here we have i have more uh, you know detailedly explained each terminology here so runoff again to calculate runoff it is nothing but outflow and inflow you can see here r inflow r outflow so that is runoff within the water body and runoff which is going out of the water body again for the groundwater flow also okay so this is a small uh, numerical problem we have related to water budget uh, equation so i'll read out the question a small catchment area 150 hectares received a rainfall of 10.5 cm in 90 minutes due to a storm at the outer of the catchment the stream draining the catchment was dry before the storm and experienced a runoff lasting for 10 hours with an average discharge of 1.5 meter cube per second the stream was again dry after the runoff event we have two conditions first one what is the amount of water which was not available to run off due to combined effect of infiltration evaporation and transpiration the second one is what is the ratio of run off to precipitation so let us identify the given data first so we have a uh, surface area as 150 hectares we have for how much of duration that is 10 hours we have what is the amount of precipitation occurring during that 10.5 cm we have outflow or the discharge occurring 1.5 m3 per second okay so what does the water budget equation say we have runoff to calculate that uh, you know precipitation minus your losses so we'll see what are the terminologies we have 
we have the runoff. What is that runoff which is given as 1.5 meter cube per second? So how much uh, in terms of meter cube, in terms of volume, we have converted that. See, for how many hours it is occurring? It is occurring for about 10 hours, right? So meter cube per second. So you have to convert this hours to second. So 10 hours into 60 minutes into seconds, 60 seconds. So you, if you multiply that, you get 54,000 meter cube. So we have got runoff, okay? Next, also, we have got the data related to your precipitation here, you can see. How do we calculate the precipitation? For how many, uh, you know, meters? It is 10.5 centimeter. We have converted it to meters, dividing it by 100 into for how much area the precipitation occurs. See, this is what the difference is, okay? So uh, how much of uh, the rainfall is occurring for particular area. So we are multiplying that depth into area to get the volume because you see the left hand side is also you have got in terms of volume in meter cube and hence the right hand side should also be in the same units. So 10.5 centimeter the sense 10.5 divided by 100 meters into the area okay 150 hectares. So again hectares to meter square conversion you have to multiply the value with 10 raised to 4. So 10.5 into 150 to 10 raised to 4 divided by 100, you get 1,57,500 meter cube. Okay. So uh, what is asked you, what is the amount of water which was not available for the runoff to occur? So runoff is equals to P minus L. So what is the losses that you need to calculate? Losses is nothing but the precipitation minus your runoff. So you have calculated your precipitation. And then you have calculated your runoff. So if you deduct that, you will get what are the losses. Okay. So they have also asked you to calculate the runoff to precipitation, uh, you know, ratio. So you have calculated your runoff. You have calculated your precipitation. You find the ratio. Okay. So again, here, you see here, you can observe. Uh, here, uh, sometimes, usually we get confused of uh, specifically return meter cube here because that we usually see that meter cube is there meter cube is there in the both the term obviously the result should have meter cube also no because numerator also it has meter cube denominator also it has meter cube obviously the unit will can cancel so the coefficient value or the ratio should be only in the numericals okay if you find in the option you need to be easily able to identify the value Okay. So this is a simple problem where we have applied the water budget equation. So the next important thing is, you know, uh, we have discussed the distance, height and everything will directly go into optimum number of rain gauges. So first we understood uh, what are the different types of rain gauge systems we have. And, uh, uh, you know, we understood about uh, the water budget equation. A simple problem related to water budget equation. So we'll directly move on to the next important topic that is optimum number of rain gauges. So how do we calculate the optimum number of rain gauges? So, uh, you know, uh, for a certain area you would calculate or existing would be, you know, uh, 10 number of rain gauges. You calculate what should be the optimum number, which was enough to record the amount of precipitation occurring if there was already 10 existing but when you calculate you found out that the optimum number of rain gauge systems required for that particular area was only seven that means you had three number of rain gauges which is extra provided in that precipitation area and hence if you know if uh, your seven rain gauge systems are effectively working in a good condition, you could still do effectively your hydrological analysis in that particular area with, uh, you know, certain allowable error that is important. So how do we calculate the optimum number of rain gauges by using this formula? N is equals to CV by E whole squared. So CV is coefficient of variation of rainfall based on the existing rain gauge system. And E is nothing but the allowable percentage error. So here, how do we calculate CV? CV is calculated from uh, the formula 100 sigma by E. Okay, where sigma is the standard deviation 
and p bar or p is nothing but the uh, mean average rainfall okay so using this uh, we can easily calculate what is coefficient of variation so again here how do we calculate the mean average uh, precipitation here so average precipitation is nothing but the summation of uh, the total uh, rainfall divided by the uh, final number of precipitation that is uh, number of stations if assume you have four station data in that a particular area and you have each uh, from each station you have a rainfall record four values summation of all that four values divided by four that will give you what is the mean average precipitation okay so and then your standard deviation that is sigma is obtained from the summation of p minus p bar whole square divided by n minus 1. So these are the formulas that you need to know to calculate the optimum number of rain gauge. n is equals to cv by e whole square. You need to know the formula of cv that is coefficient of variation and then a percentage allowable error would be given in the given problem. And then you need to calculate CV by using the formula 100 sigma by P bar, where P bar is nothing but, uh, you know, the summation of, uh, you know, all the precipitation data divided by the existing number of rain gauge. And the standard deviation is also calculated from the given formula. Okay. We'll quickly take up a numerical problem to easily understand this uh, concept. So the question says, in a catchment area, there are seven uh, rain gauge stations with average depth of rainfall as 100 centimeter and standard deviation as 31.5 centimeter. For a 90% accuracy in analysis, how many extra rain gauges are to be installed in the catchment? So, you know, they say that already uh, there was seven rain gauge stations. How many extra, again, you have to install in that particular catch? First, let us identify the given data there. What are the given data given? So, obviously, the optimum number of rain gauges is calculated using the formula here. Okay. Let us identify the given data. You see here, the average depth of rainfall is directly given. Instead of each station data, the average precipitation value, that is P bar, is directly given. Standard deviation is also directly given. Sigma is directly given. So you can easily calculate what is CV from the formula. So CV is 100 sigma by P bar. If in case here the standard deviation is not given, then uh, you will have to depend on each station data. Then each station would have been given. Data would have been given. Then you have to calculate sigma and then come back here to substitute for CV. Then you calculate the value of CV. Okay. But here, since sigma value is directly given as 31.5 centimeters into 100 divided by P bar is also in 100 centimeter. So you can see in the numerator also you have centimeter, denominator also you have centimeter, and hence the coefficient of variation is unitless. So you have got 31.5. Okay, so how do you calculate the allowable percentage error? They have given E is allowable percentage error. How much percentage of error could actually occur? They say that 90% of accuracy is there. So out of 90%, out of 100%, if you have 90% accuracy, how much is the allowable percentage error? It is nothing but 10%. So 100 minus 90 is 10%. So if you substitute in that, you have, uh, you know, N is equals to CV, which is calculated as 31.5 divided by allowable percentage error 10. Whole square, you get 9.92, that is around 10. So how many extra rain gauges do you need? The you know optimum number is given as 10. Already there was 7 which is existing. So 10 minus 7, you need 3 extra or additional to that catchment area. Okay. There is, uh, this is one more uh, similar type of problem where, uh, you know, the uh, they have asked you to calculate the extra rain gauges to be installed in the catchment area where you know the data are given uh, you know p bar and sigma value is given you will calculate what is cv that is 100 uh, sigma by p bar which gives you cv which is nothing but uh, you know the standard deviation is 35.6 divided by p bar is 150 
you would calculate your coefficient of variance that is 23.73 again they say 90 percent accuracy so allowable percentage error is 100 minus 90 which gives you 10 percent of allowable error then you substitute in the formula here n will give you 23.73 divided by 10 whole square will give you the value as 12.67 if we are approximating it to higher value we get 30. So there was already 10 existing. How many extra do we need? 13 minus 10. We need 3 extra. So this is how you calculate the optimum number of grain cases. Okay. So we'll take one more here. A catchment has uh, six uh, rain gauge stations in a year. The annual rainfall recorded by the gauges are as follows. So here you have six rain gauge stations, which is given A, B, C, D, E, F. And respective rainfall station data is also given. For 10% uh, error in the estimation of mean rainfall, calculate the optimum number of additional stations required. So here, instead of accuracy, they have given you 10% error. So allowable error, E value is directly given as 10. So here you can observe, we need to calculate the optimum number of rain gauge stations. But you can observe here, neither the standard deviation value is given or P bar value is directly given. So we need to calculate both in this case. How do we calculate? We know CV is nothing but 100 sigma by P, where P, uh, P bar, P bar is nothing but sigma P by N. And sigma uh, standard deviation is given as summation of P minus P bar whole square divided by N minus 1. So from uh, the tabla column there, we have the station data, six station data. Using that, we can easily calculate P minus P bar value. Okay. How do we get that P bar value? You see a summation of everything here summation of all the data divided by n how many existing we have six so summation of this uh, will give you 711.6 centimeter divided by six you would get certain value p is uh, the precipitation data of that particular station minus your p bar value will give you how much is uh, the value in terms of each here so it is, we can see P is how much for station A? It is 82.6. Minus P bar is nothing but 118.6. So 82.6 minus 118.6 because this value is greater value with negative sign. Obviously, your answer would also end up with a negative sign. Again, if you go to the station 2, that is B, station B, P value is 102.9 minus 118.6 you would get minus 15.7 for station c again 180.3 minus 118.6 here you can observe p value is much greater when compared to p bar and hence the value you have got the difference you have got is positive <coughs> sorry so meanwhile if you uh, get uh, the p minus p bar value of all the six stations what you have to do because to calculate standard deviation here we need p minus p bar whole square the summation of that p minus p bar whole square we need so first we need to calculate p minus p bar whole square so you've already calculated p minus p bar from the previous column you square it so whatever the negative values you have got because we are squaring it obviously it becomes plus minus into minus it becomes plus so that is 6 into 6, 15.7 into 15.7. So 16.7 square, 8.3 square, 19.8 square, 18.1 square. Okay. Once you sum it up, you get summation of P minus P bar whole square. Or the whole numerator you will get. How do you calculate the uh, standard deviation? Just nothing but this whole numerator. That is summation of P minus P bar whole square, which is nothing but 6137.92 divided by n minus 1 n is nothing but the existing rain gauge which we have six numbers here so 6 minus 1 if you do n square root of that you get 35.03 so in the previous problems we had standard deviation which was readily given but here we have calculated the standard deviation 
Once we calculated the standard deviation, we know what is P bar is, uh, you see, 118.6. We know the standard deviation. We can easily calculate what is CV. Once we calculate CV, we can easily calculate what is the optimum number of range. Okay. So what they have asked you to calculate, they have asked you to calculate what is the optimum number of additional stations required. You see, the optimum number is 9. Existing was 6. How many extra we need? We need... 3 extra, that is 9 minus 6, we need 3 additional station. So this is how we resolve uh, when uh, standard deviation or your P bar value is not given. Okay, so this is uh, one more numerical problem. It's a very interesting numerical problem. Determine the optimum number of uh, rain gauge stations to be established in the basin of it is desired to the limits, the error in the mean value of rain gauge to 10%. Calculate the minimum additional station required. Also, what is the percentage accuracy of the existing network in the estimation of average depth of rainfall over the basin? Okay, so here the isohytal maps are given here. You can just observe in the graphical representation. And for each station, the rainfall data is also given. Okay, so particularly for, uh, you know, uh, you can see this tabla column. Uh, usually they give you the tabla column or else if, you give, if they give you this figure, you need to understand. You see at station A, the station data is given as 88 centimeter that I have taken up here. Okay. And then, um, sorry, at station B, it is 104 centimeter. At station C, it is 138. At station D, it is 78. At station E, it is 56. So this is how the station data is taken. First, what you need to calculate, they have asked you, there are two sectors. Any sector could be asked. There are two sectors here. We'll try to understand both the sectors. First, we'll take how to uh, we'll see how to calculate the minimum additional station which is required. So to calculate that, obviously it is nothing but the optimum number. We know how do we calculate n is equals to cv by e whole square, where c is 100 sigma by p bar, and p bar is sigma p by n, and sigma, you know, sigma is also given. Okay, so we know the station data again in the previous problem as we done, we calculated what is p bar. How do we calculate P bar? Summation of all the precipitation data divided by, we have five stations here, divided by five, you get P bar as 92.8. Okay. So the next column we have calculated P minus P bar. So P of station A is 88 minus 92.8 and hence you have got minus value here. Whereas for station B, uh, P minus P bar is 104 minus uh, 92.8 and hence you have got a positive value here. Similarly, you will calculate P minus P bar for all the five stations. Okay. So the for the next column, what you do? P minus P bar whole square. So your third column, you're squaring the value. So 4.8 square, 11.2 square, 45.2 square, 14.8 square, 36.8 square. So whenever you're squaring, don't worry about the negative sign because minus into minus, it becomes plus. Again, once you calculate P minus P bar whole square to calculate your uh, you know, standard deviation, you can just observe your numerator here. It is the summation of P minus P bar whole square. That means we have to add it up. When we add it up, you get 3764.8. So that you substitute in the numerator divided by n minus 1 existing is 5 number of rain gauge systems. 5 minus 1 square root of that you get sigma. Once you get sigma you can easily calculate what is cv that is 100 sigma by p bar. And then you can easily calculate what is n. Okay, So you can easily observe there we have uh, optimum number as 11. How many additional stations we need existing was 5. So 11 minus 5, you need 6 additional stations. So here for the given allowable percentage error, we need to calculate what is the accuracy, percentage accuracy. Okay. So for uh, the given zonal area, for the given, uh, you know, calculated error for that, how much would be the 
accuracy okay that means if you easily calculate uh, the uh, you know uh, the error if you easily calculate the error then it will be easily uh, easy for you to calculate the accuracy okay so if i go back here how much if you have to just remember the cv value here cv is how much you have got uh, it is 33.1 okay so now what we have done here these are all the the zonal area which was given and everything okay uh, when you calculate that particular uh, uh, value you have converted it to decimal value where you are rounding off uh, you can see 0.6 for the first zone, it was the rain gauge, number of rain gauge required was 0.6. I cannot give 0.6 rain gauge, so I have rounded it off to 1. There was already one rain gauge system. If I go back to that figure, uh, you will better understand. You can see here, zone 1, this is zone 1. There is already an existing rain gauge here, that is station E. 1 was required, but uh, existing is also 1. I will go to zone 2 here. In this zone 2, 1 was required, 1 is already there. In zone 3, if I go, I'll go back to that here. In zone 3, if I go, rounded, see the value I had got as 4.4, uh, which was rounded off to 4, because if this was 4.5, I would have rounded off to 5, but since the decimal point is lesser than 0.5, I have rounded off to lesser value 4, but the existing rain gauge system is 1. You can see in this zone, complete zone here, complete zone from here to here, we have got only one station that is A. We would have got four. So there we are lagging there. Again, similarly, we have calculated. Okay. Additional rain gauges. What is that additional rain gauges? See how many we have got the additional rain gauges. We have got six, right? 11 was there. Five was already existing. Uh, 11 minus 5, you have got 6. That is how the justification we have shown here. So, 3 extra we need in zone 3, 2 extra we need in zone 4, and 1 extra we need in zone 6. So, total of 6 number of radius systems. What is the percentage accuracy? So, optimum number or the percentage uh, error, how do we calculate? Percentage error is uh, how much the allowable error could occur while measuring the data of the existing rain gauge system. So because of that only, you can just observe not taken it as 6 here. 6 is what? 6 is the optimum number. We can calculate the percentage error for the existing rain gauge system and not for the calculated optimum, error, optimum number of rain gauge. So if we use the same formula, n is equals to, uh, you know, cv by e whole square. If we use the same formula here, uh, you know, if you remove the square on the right hand side, you get the square root on the left hand side. So we need what is the allowable percentage error. So if you take E on the uh, left hand side, you get CV by root 10. So CV already we have calculated from the previous step, 33.1 divided by root 5. Again, why we have got 5 here, why we didn't take 6, because allowable percentage error is calculated for the existing number of rain gauge systems. So uh, we have got uh, percentage allowable error as 15%. If the allowable error is 15%, then how much would be the percentage accuracy of calculation of rain gauges? It would be 100 minus 15, which gives you 85% of accuracy. So this is how uh, we uh, calculate the percentage accuracy for the given data. So we solved the problems related to, uh, you know, calculations of uh, optimum number of rain gauge we also solved a few simple problem related to water budget equation the next we'll calculate on uh, we'll uh, concentrate on the calculations of missing precipitation data of any given station so uh, in the uh, you know the flow chart while we were discussing about the topics that has to be discussed we saw that for calculating missing data we have two methods there one is uh, a simple average and normal ratio method. There are two methods there. So for the given problem, how do we identify that which method we have to adopt and how do we resolve it? Okay, we'll take a simple problem. A norm, the normal annual rainfall at uh, four rain gauge stations installed at a catchment area A, B, C, and D 
the data are given as 75 centimeter, 100 centimeter, 60 centimeter, and 80 centimeter, respectively. In a particular year, the depth of rainfall measured at rain gauges A, B, and C are 60 centimeter, 70 centimeter, and 90 centimeter, respectively, whereas the measurement on rain gauge D was missing. The rainfall depth at station D could be estimated as dash centimeter. So here, uh, you know, value. So here the annual values are given. You can see the normal annual values for the four stations are given. N A is 75, N B is given, N C and N D is given. Similarly, the precipitation data for that particular year, for that particular stations are given. For A, it is given as uh, 60 centimeters, that is precipitation at station A, and hence PA, PB, and PC is given. Which data is missing? The data is missing relative to station B. That is PD value we need to calculate. Okay. So as I said, we have simple average method and normal ratio method. Now, how would you identify which method that you have to uh, use to calculate the missing data? So I have, uh, to make it easier to understand, I have written what are the normal annual rainfalls with respect to four station data uh, we have got written here. And also the precipitation data with respect to each station we have got here. Okay, so which station data is missing is represented in the form of question mark. That is, at the normal annual rainfall at station D being 80 centimeter, how much is the precipitation data at the station D? That we need to calculate. So how do we calculate is uh, the station data which is missing? We need to take the normal annual rainfall of that particular station data. We need to calculate how much is the data with respect to plus or minus 10 centimeter value, 10% value. That is minus 10%, that is 90% of that, plus 10% is 110% of that particular value. To know the range, okay, to know the range, we need to calculate plus or minus 10% of the given value, okay. So 90% of 80 centimeter in the sense 0 0.9 into 80, you get 72 centimeter. So uh, plus 10% of the given value in the sense 110 cent, 110 percentage uh, of 80 centimeters so that is 1.1 1 .1 into 80 centimeter so the variation uh, of range or range of the values is between 72 centimeter to 88 centimeter so how do you identify between these two methods is if you have to see the normal annual rainfall values here if the normal annual rainfall values varies between 72 to 88 centimeter then you directly go for simple average or you have to adopt normal ratio see here the range is between 72 to 88 you have to just observe in the values given for normal annual rainfall of all the four stations here the first value is 75 obviously it is within the range the second value is 100 centimeter which is outside the range the station c data is 60 centimeter within the range station d data is 80 centimeter within the range but you have one station data which is outside the range then you cannot go for simple average method okay so when you cannot go for simple average method when the values are not within the range of 10 10 uh, plus or minus 10 percentile then you have to go for normal ratio method how will you calculate using normal ratio method is the the data uh, which is missing the precipitation data which is missing missing that is pd by nd is equal to how many station data we know? We know the three station data. Therefore, 1 by 3 times PA by NA plus PB by NB plus PC by NC. So using this formula, we can easily calculate what is PD value. That is the missing station value, precipitation value at station D. In case if in the given problem, if uh, uh, you know all the normal annual rainfall of all the station lies within the range of calculations of 10 uh, plus or minus 10 percentile then we can directly go for simple average method which can be easily calculated as pa plus pb plus pc divided by 3. this is simple average only we can use this only when 
uh, when you calculate this plus or minus 10 percentile, the range, this normal annual rainfall is within the range, then only we can go for simple average. So uh, we'll take uh, one more problem here, similar to that kind to just for the practice. We have got uh, you know, normal annual rainfalls uh, for similarly the same stations A, B, C, and D. The precipitation data is given for A, B, and C, whereas the precipitation data for station D is missing. That you have to calculate. So we'll identify N, A, N, B, N, C, and N, D. Similarly, P, A, P, B, and P, C. Okay, so as I said, we have two methods. We need to identify which are the two methods that we need to know. So for the last day, uh, station data, which was missing, we'll take that, we'll calculate plus or minus 10 percentile, that is 90 percent of 85 and 110 centimeters of 85, we'll get the range. So if the normal annual rainfall is within the range, then we go for simple average or we'll go for normal ratio. So here you can observe at station B, the uh, normal annual rainfall is 105 centimeter is not within the range. And hence, we have to go for normal ratio method. So again, for the normal ratio method, PD, that is the precipitation data, which is missing at station D divided by the known normal annual rainfall of station D is equal to how many station data we know. You have to just observe uh, above the unknown data, how many station data we know, actually. So we know the three station data. So one by three times PA by NA plus PB by NB plus PC by NC. If you substitute the value and calculate, you would get the precipitation data of uh, the missing precipitation data at station D as 87.42 centimeter. If it was within the range, you can easily calculate by simple average by just PA plus PB plus PC divided by three. This is how uh, we calculate for missing precipitation data. The next we'll concentrate on the calculations of mean uh, precipitation. This is also one of the most important topic. So uh, as we know, there are a you know, few methods to calculate the mean precipitation. One is arithmetic mean, which is also called a simple average method, these and polygon method and isohydral method. Isohydral method, I'll come next. First, uh, arithmetic mean or simple average, we just show, uh, saw that. Uh, if a number of station data is given, like if you have three station data, PA, PB, PC, divided by three, you get simple average method. It is nothing but arithmetic mean. It is very simple. First, we'll try to understand these and polygon method. We'll assume uh, we have the station data like this. We'll just observe the first figure here. We have four stations, P, Q, R, and S four stations representing four corners of the square okay so uh, of uh, each side of four meters so what we have to do first is uh, we need to uh, you know divide that entire complete square into the uh, small polygons by drawing the perpendicular bisectors for each side so for this side we have to draw the perpendicular bisector for uh, qr and rs and also ps once we draw, draw the perpendicular bisectors, this entire uh, you know, rectangle or the square is divided into four components or four simple polygon areas, A1, A2, A3, and A4. Okay, If you are actually by uh, definition or by rule, if you are calculating uh, the mean precipitation using these in polygon, you calculate it by P1 into A1, plus P2 into A2, that is P2 is nothing but uh, the, the precipitation data at station 1, precipitation data at station 2, precipitation data at station 3, precipitation data at station 4. So P1 A1 plus P2 A2 plus P3 A3 plus P4 A4 divided by the total area A1 A2 A3 A4. This is the usual process. But then what is the hint here, the clue to calculate uh, for your gate uh, solutions is we can see this by drawing the perpendiculars by perpendicular bisectors. This entire rectangle is divided into four equal parts. Okay, so easily you don't have to even take the area value because one fourth of that precipitation plus one fourth of that precipitation will give you directly the P bar. So P1 into 1 by 4 plus P2 into 1 by 4 plus P3 into 1 by 4 plus P4 into 1 by 4. 
Okay, so usual procedure is P1 A1 plus P2 A2 plus P3 A3 plus P4 A4 divided by total area. But since we are drawing the perpendicular bisectors, it is divided into four equal parts. So each precipitation data you can simply multiply by one by four. You will get what is the arithmetic mean or mean precipitation data. This is where it is in the form of rectangle. Or else, if uh, the station is in the form of triangle, equilateral triangle, how do we resolve? So, in case of equilateral triangle, again, we have three stations, P, Q, and R. Again, here, to uh, you know, get the uh, simple polygons, we have to draw the perpendicular bisectors on each side of side A meters each. So, we are drawing the perpendicular bi bisectors on each side. So what happens here since because of equilateral triangle, it is divided into three equal parts, A1, A2, and A3. Again, by definition, if you are going because of three components, we have P1, A1 plus P2, A2 plus P3, A3 divided by A1 plus A2 plus A3. Okay. Again, uh, what happens here, we need to calculate the area of this component, each component, and then substitute here. If not, the area value is not given in the given question. Otherwise, there is one simple way to calculate the P average value or arithmetic uh, you know, or mean precipitation in case of equilateral triangle is that by calculating since uh, by drawing the uh, perpendicular bisectors, it is divided into three equal components. So that areas could be easily calculated as one by three times because it is three components, one by three times root three by four A square, where small a is nothing but each side how much is the distance between each side that is if small a is four meters then one by three into root three by four into four square that multiplied by the station data you will get how much is the value so that is in case of uh, you know three stations in the form of triangle so also when we get five rain gauge stations, so this is one example where uh, if if not uh, the station T was present, it is similar to your first uh, illustration. But here we have got five rain gauge stations. I'll show you what is the uh, the common mistake we do. Each side is given as four meters. So what we do because we said uh, polygons. It is divided into uh, small equal polygons here, uh, dividing it into five parts because uh, how we are drawing the perpendiculars, you see here, this red line would not be given. What uh, the data would be given? The data would be given only, which is highlighted in black color. What we do, we draw the perpendicular bisectors from each side. So from here also I have drawn, from here I've drawn. So I've connected all these points so that uh, the area is divided into A1, A2, A3, A4. You can see this A1, A2, A3, A4 is in the form of triangle. If I'm calculating the area, I can easily calculate it as half into base into height. That is A1 would be equal to A2, would be equal to A3 and A4, which is nothing but half into base into height. So if I take this small triangle here, you can see the base is 4 meters. The height is also 2 meters. Uh, you know, complete triangle if I'm taking. so, the, But I cannot use that. Why I cannot use that? Because I'm not drawing the perpendicular bisectors connecting each station. So this calculation would be wrong when I'm not drawing the perpendicular bisectors connecting to each station. You see here, station T is not at all connected. Then what do I have to do? I have to also draw the perpendicular bisectors from station T to each side. Okay. Then only I can uh, justify for the perpendicular bisectors for all the five stations. Then only I can apply the these and polygon method. The one thing you have to know is I have to connect the perpendicular bisectors of all the components. Okay. So uh, you can see here A1, you see how many components is divided into because I've also drawn the perpendicular bisectors from t station T on each side, how many components it is divided into one, two, three, four, four outside triangles, four inside triangles. So the entire rectangle is divided into eight components where A1, A2, A3, A4 is one by eight. You can see A5 is nothing but how many components you have four times. So four into one by eight. Okay. So P1 into A1 
which is nothing but P1 into 1 by 8 plus P2 into 1 by 8 plus P3 into 1 by 8 plus P4 into 1 by 8 plus P5 into 4 by 8. That's it. You get P bar or average uh, precipitation or mean precipitation. Okay. So this is where again you have six uh, rain gauge stations that is P, Q, R, S, T and again you have D here. So as I said, what you have to do from that station also, you have to draw the perpendicular bisectors. So it is divided into, you can see the area highlighted here, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and A6. So it is divided into six components. So how do we calculate? So each side is given. You can see A1 and A2 is in the form of triangle, half into base into height, clear? Again, you can see here A5 uh, by, uh, you know, the concept of equilateral triangle. We know the area could be calculated as 1 by 3 times uh, root 3 by 4 into A square. So we know what is A5 also. But what is A3 and A4? A3 and A4, you can just observe. See, if I draw the line here, if you can just observe it is, see, uh, if I just draw the line here, this portion is also uh, uh, the second component of triangle. This portion is the second component of triangle. So which is nothing but related to same area A5. But when it comes to this lower part, it is the same area as A1 and A2. So A3 and A4 is nothing but A1 plus this A5 will give you how much is A3 and A4. Okay. But whereas A6, you can see if you take the uh, hypotenuse here, if this is 2 root of uh, 2 square plus 2 square because we have taken the hypotenuse here. So A6. So once we get A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and A6, you can easily calculate the arithmetic mean or average precipitation for the given station data. So uh, we have, uh, we can easily calculate uh, the mean precipitation where we have four stations, three stations, five stations, and six stations. Okay. This is a simple problem given. So the catchment area is in the shape of a pentagon as shown in the figure. Rain gauges are installed at each corner. The precipitation values are given. At A, it is 9 centimeter. B is 14. C is 5.2. At D is 4.8. At E, it is 6.8. And one rain gauge is kept at the center of the square area, which is measuring 6 centimeter. Okay, you need to calculate what is the uh, mean precipitation. How will you do? So here, what you have to do, you have to draw the perpendicular bisectors at each case as we had done here. Same data, we have drawn the perpendicular bisectors. So for this triangle also, again, we have to draw the perpendicular bisectors. Again, the same formulas if you use, you can easily calculate the value. Okay, the same illustration, the same area of, uh, you know, uh, the formulas that we need to use to calculate the values. This is how we need to calculate the mean precipitation. You try out this. Okay, you can take the values. A is equal to 9 centimeter. B is equal to 14 centimeter. C is equal to 5.2 and D is 4.8. E is 6.8 centimeter. And the sixth station that is F, station F being the value of 6 centimeters. The next is the calculation, mean calculations, uh, mean precipitation calculation using isohydral method. So we have seen arithmetic mean. We have seen, uh, you know, these and polygon. So the third method is isohydral method, which is the most superior and consistent method of calculation for mean precipitation compared to uh, the other two, that is arithmetic mean and, uh, you know, these and polygon method. So what is iso height? Iso height is nothing but a line which is passing through the depth of equal rainfall, which is called as iso height. So assume you have the iso heights, that is nothing but the line passing through the equal depths of rainfall being 40 centimeter, 50 centimeter, 60 centimeter, 70 and 80 centimeter. So if they have asked you to calculate the mean precipitation of the highlighted area here, how do you calculate is because See, A1, A2, A3. A1 is between the two lines. Area is between the two lines. So it is dependent on, A1 is dependent on the two high so heights. That is from 
150 centimeter iso height and 60 centimeter iso height so how do we calculate the mean precipitation in case of iso height and method is that 50 plus 60 divided by 2 into that area plus 60 plus 70 divided by 2 into that area 70 plus 80 divided by 2 into that uh, area that is a3 divided by total area would give you what is the mean precipitation in case of iso height and method so uh, this is the simple uh, you know formula uh, the, the data is given related to iso height and method the analysis uh, of a storm yielded the following information regarding iso heights calculate average depth of rainfall so iso height interval is given like 70 to 80 similarly like here we have given right 40 uh, 50 60 70 80 80 while writing here because of a1 we have taken 50 to 60 similarly they have taken 70 to 80 area is 10 80 to 90 it is 85 90 to 100 is 113 100 to 110 is 98 110 to 120 is 136 120 to 130 is 67 km square so how do we calculate p average is 70 plus 80 divided by 2 into 10 plus 80 plus 90 divided by 2 into 85 90 plus 100 divided by 2 into 130 that is 90 plus 100 divided by 2 is 95 similarly we have taken it divided by the total area that is 10 plus 85 plus 113 plus 98 plus 136 plus 67 so you get uh, the average depth of rainfall as 104.16 mm okay why it is in millimeters because the high so height interval is also in terms of millimeters clear so high so height majorly it depends on the previous uh, high so height line plus the existing high so height line for the given area for the same thing also we can easily calculate what will be the arithmetic mean also you can simply uh, you know take up all the values divided by what is uh, the uh, you know uh, number of stations you get easily arithmetic mean so we understood uh, the three methods that is uh, one is simple average method arithmetic mean or uh, we have got thiessen polygon method and also we have seen isohydral method we have solved quite a, a number of problems we'll quickly understand uh, what are the merits and demerits of this So arithmetic means and these and polygon methods are only mechanical and mathematical process and do not require any special skills whereas the isohydral method requires a lot of extra special judgment for drawing the contours isohydral method is more uh, superior and uh, uh, accurate method if completion of contours is best done so it will mainly depends upon the contour mappings and also depends upon the judgment of the person who is completing those contours also in high cycle method suitable importance is attached to the various stations which is not so in arithmetic mean method because isohydral method is mainly dependent on the judgment of the contours the reports is also suitably attached to that uh, with respect to each station so in uh, isohydral method the stations which are situated beyond the boundary of the drainage basin are also used to determine the mean rainfall on the basin because we have determining the mean uh, precipitation or the average precipitation between the iso heights so and hence uh, all the stations also which is situated beyond the boundary of the drainage basin is also taken into influence so what are the usual uh, uh, errors we make in measurement of the rainfall the first error is the rain gauges cannot accurately measure the amount of rainfall which would have fallen at the gauge site because some amount what is falling which could go into the receiver cylinder or it might go out of the receiver so there are some error with respect to rain gauge stations and also magnitude of underestimation which depends on type of gauge height of the rim of the gauge intensity of rainfall wind speed all these magnitude of all these values will also play a very important role in measurement of rainfall the third point is dense in collector rim of the gauge which changes its receiving area 
any damages to the gauges also plays a very important role. Apart from that, some of the major uh, sources of errors are improper reading of measuring cylinder, spilling of some of the water while transferring the measuring jar in case of non-recording type, inability to transfer all the water from the reservoir to the measuring jar. So there might be some manual error. Also. So uh, in the next session, we'll uh, you know try to understand about uh, more related to Moscow and hydrograph. We'll see about, you know, we have finished our energy balance or water balance uh, equation, water budget equation. We'll try to understand about pan evaporation in more detail. We have finished our water budget equation here. So uh, in the next session, that is tomorrow, uh, the uh, day eight, I have a session uh, between 3.45 to 5.15. So we'll try to cover the remaining topics of hydrology during that period. So thank you so much uh, for your attention and stay tuned. Come back to the next session. We'll continue with the hydrology topic. Thank you. Sir. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mugusriman. It was an informative session. And thank you all participants for your patience with me. Without any further delay, let us start with the next session at exactly at 3.45 a.m. Thank you. Thank you all. Stay tuned.